Okay, so welcome back to the last lecture of this week, uh, where we will use these representation theory notions that we've talked about already, and the Schur's lemma, for example, to really talk about the notion of Fourier analysis in a general group. And uh, for this purpose, if I want to really do it properly, I need to define this notion of dual group, which is defined using the irreducible representations. And having this definition of the dual group allows me to define the notion of Fourier transform. Uh, in this uh, in this uh, uh, non-abelian setting where we are doing this. So let's go to the definition of the dual group. So the dual group, <coughs> I call it hat G, so we have the finite group and then the hat G, uh, is uh, basically what, what, what I could say that this is the uh, is the index set for all irreducible unitary uh, representations of G uh, up to an iso isomorphism. So that's what I want to say that this is like maybe a bit like uh, uh, a bit vague definition, but basically what this means that uh, i.e. that we can take uh, write this g bar as the set of some xi's such that there, for each of the xi uh, they corresponds to some uh, mapping um, uh, uh, map of uh, rho xi in this uh, with this uh, uh, g which is a u and it maps into some v rho xi this is a unitary an irreducible representation. Uh, so we have chosen one of those uh, uh, irreducible representations. So if we fix an element psi inside this group, it corresponds to some irreducible representations, and uh, every other irreducible representation of G is isomorphic to one and only one of these things. Uh, so this is chosen to such that uh, um, you could say that uh, um, and that uh, every um, irreducible unitary uh, representation uh, rho from G to U uh, well, just taken any uh, irreducible representations, is uh, isomorphic to one and only one um, uh, row. So, if you really want to be precise, it's basically the set of all the classes. So if you remember that if you have an irreducible representation, this unitary representation is irreducible, it corresponds to a single other representation. So the, it has all the, all the other representations that are isomorphic to it. So we basically identify them to be one. So the dual group consists of the classes. So it's kind of, you could think about it also that these eight size could be the sets. So one way to think about this is the um, if uh, uh, we, we say that the row 1 and uh, row 2 are equivalent, if, uh, if the uh, row 1 and row 2 are uh, isomorphic, then we could say that the corresponding, uh, we could say that the psi corresponds to uh, 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 is the set of all equivalence classes of this uh, uh, equivalence relation. There are a couple of ways to think about this, but uh, you can keep in mind that basically we want to basically identify all the representations which are not, uh, not the same, so that's what the main idea, main idea with, the, with the proof is. So, 
now if you're satisfied with this, so that means basically when I was choosing a xi inside this duo group, that means that I'm basically fixing one of the representations, rho xi, with this form. And uh, in some sense I'm dealing with all the representations at the same time, because there, this is, it's a set of possible uh, uh, unitary irreducible representations inside this class. So I'm going to be using now light that uh, uh, this also that uh, um, also uh, I will use this notation that uh, if you take one, I'm, I'm using this kind of notation, one corresponds to to the uh, trivial representation. I'm thinking that this has this element one to correspond to the one of the trivial uh, one trivial representation uh, uh, in the group. So we have this like set that it has all the irreducible um, non-trivial representations, then this one uh, uh, trivial representation inside this group. So this corresponds to the trivial representation, which I call it like row one, for example, which is a mapping from G uh, unitary of some V one in the. In the in the space. <clears throat> okay, so that's the that's the setting we want to talk about here. And uh, what else do I, did I want to say about the duo group? I think it, it has a kind of like, a, it doesn't exactly have a group structure, but you can prove that because of this equivalent relation and actually using uh, uh, this uh, Schur's lemma actually, you can prove that this is a finite set. So this actually if you go through all the possible uh, classes of the irreducible representations with a finite uh, unitary representation, you can actually prove this a finite set. So when we are doing like uh, elements in the, inside this uh, example, we will get a, a finite example of, uh, of this space. So that's the kind of the definition. Okay, and uh, not, now what the plan is, is to use this um, um, dual group to define the notion of a Fourier transform of a function. So let's do it in the following. So, um, uh, so right now, uh, from now on, that uh, uh, if the xi belongs to this uh, dual group v xi, uh, we will use this notation of my xi to be this, this v xi, uh, and then we also write, um, well, I do the, that's the main thing. I don't want to be repeating this uh, subindex for the for the subspace that this is this is corresponding to. this corresponds to this uh, this representation. So the definition this is the Fourier transform in uh, in G uh, is the following. So we let the function G as usual be a, some complex valued function. Uh, and uh, we take a xi in, our, uh, in this dual group, so it corresponds to one of the classes. So this corresponds to basically a one representation. Uh, then we define the Fourier transform at uh, this uh, dual group element xi to be equal to this sum, and when we take the weights of these complex numbers, and then we take the representation rho weight. So remember that this thing is a, a linear map from v, ro, a v xi to v xi, but this remember that this uh, this is a um, complex vector space, so we can multiply by complex numbers here. So that's why we can define this formally that you can think about the complex number f x as a scalar, so we can map, uh, sum them together. So we get a well defined number. So what happens here is that um, this also, this is now actually a, a, a mapping, actually, um, this is a, a, now the, uh, let me write this here, now this uh, f xi is also a mapping from v xi to v xi, is a linear map, because it's a, a finite sum of linear maps, it's a finite group. So that's the way thing that the Fourier transform in the group Zp was just equal to the like a complex number, but now we actually get that they become operators, they become linear maps themselves. So uh, maybe I can give you an example of how to use this. So uh, maybe an example is that uh, if mu is a probability distribution from g to 0, 1, is a probability distribution. 
then actually this uh, Fourier transform at 1 is equal to the identity matrix at 1. Remember that uh, this is the corresponding I1, which is the V1 to V1 identity. And the 1 corresponds to the trivial representations. Recall 1 in G uh, corresponds to, uh, to the trivial representation. Uh, row 1. I used this notation on row 1, which was uh, basically this uh, identity uh, representation v1, uh, where the v1 is the vector space you want to consider this. So why is this true? This just follows from the definition that is a probability distribution. So what you can do is that if you compute the Fourier transform at 1, then by definition this is just equal to the sum. You take the mu of x and then you take row 1 of x, that's the trivial representation. And uh, now what we can do is that uh, uh, this is, because it's a trivial representation, this is the identity matrix, so this, uh, this is just equal to the uh, identity matrix I1, which is a V1 to V1 uh, identity. So we have this is equal to the sum x in G mu of x of I1. But now it's, a, it's actually a probability distribution, so you're summing the same operator V times, so this actually, this sum is just equal to 1, so this becomes just 1 uh, times uh, 1 of i, which is, which is i1. So that's the, that's the proof of this, like we're kind of formally, uh, if you want to think. And if you remember that this kind of corresponds to the identity in the group Zp, where we had that the Fourier transform at 0 is equal to 1. So now we have the kind of same kind of a, a property. Uh, and another example, which is uh, uh, maybe more illustrative, is the, is the Lebesgue, or the uniform distribution, is that if lambda uh, x is this uniform distribution, x in G, uh, then we can compute the uh, Fourier transform to be, again, it's the identity matrix in the case of uh, xi is equal to the, of course, the trivial representation, and it's zero matrix when xi is non-zero. So here, uh, uh, this uh, zero is the, well, it's kind of the zero representation, but this is the zero matrix, it uh, is the uh, zero matrix uh, when you have this, so the zero map, that it maps every point in the, in, in the different point. So you could think about this as a representation, uh, it would be like, um, uh, zero uh, x is equal to x, if it would be like a zero, a zero representation. <clears throat> so how do you prove this? So the first part, we already have this defect, size 1, because the probability distribution, we already have the first psi 1 is equal to 1, but how do you get the, uh, get the second one? So uh, let uh, xi be uh, non 1, so this is uh, now uh, uh, in the dual group, so this is in, uh, in the dual group. So we now have that, uh, uh, so we let this uh, rho xi be the corresponding G, uh, uh, unitary representation. Uh, this is uh, the irreducible. Uh, um, representation that corresponds to the one that we chose in the in the index, and this is a, a non-trivial. So it, it is not like um, acting as an identity matrix. So because it's a it's a non-trivial, that means that there exists an x zero in the group such that this row psi at x zero is not equal to the identity matrix of the of the xi. So this uh, i xi is the identity matrix v xi, v xi identity. It's not equal to that. So there's one point where it's not equal to the identity matrix. In other words, it would be a trivial representation that it would, at every point it would correspond to a uh, identity matrix. So um, how do we use this to now to compute the Fourier transform? So let's, let's use the definition. So the Fourier transform is just defined to be the sum of x g and lambda x and rho xi x, that's the definition. Uh, and if you open this up, remember that this is just equal to 1 over g, 
So we get that this is equal to actually 1 over g, I take this out in the sum, x in g, and then rho xi of x. That's what this become. Okay, that's the definition. And now I want to prove basically uh, that this is zero. Why is this zero? If I can prove that this sum is zero, then I can prove that this whole uh, operation is zero uh, for any x in g. That's what I... Uh, <coughs> well, I want to prove that the sum, some of these elements is, uh, is equal to zero. So how do we get this uh, uh, holding? Is the following way. So uh, we can define, we can use the irreducibility, that's the main idea. We need to somehow use the fact that the rho psi is an irreducible representation. So we again have to construct maybe some subspace where things like maybe is everything or nothing. So let's use the w to be the uh, action on the group. So we take this, uh, this sum x in g, rho of psi of x, and we act on uh, v and take v in the v psi. So we take all the possible elements that you have here. Uh, so now this uh, v is a subspace uh, as this uh, rho xi x v xi to v xi is linear. So it's a linear combination of uh, uh, like a linear maps up in space. So you get a subspace of the whole space in this way. Um, because this is a vector space, basically, you have here, uh, in the here. Okay, and uh, this v x i is a vector space. <coughs> so, moreover, because this is a homomorphism, this rho psi, remember that this, uh, it's a, um, a representation that as this rho is g to u v x i is a uh, uh, homomorphism, uh, we have the following uh, uh, property that we have this rho y y when you sum over the group g of rho xi of x and we act on a point uh, um, I'm taking this, yeah, that this happens for every x and y in g, the following expression uh, and I have the v here, then uh, I'm just looking at this expression. I want to basically, but my aim is to prove that this is an invariant subspace. So I want to basically act on from the left with the general elements. So what I can do here is that I can open this up and I can put the, it's inside the sum. So I can put the x over g, uh, sorry, this is just for any, any, y, any y in g, because the sum is inside already. And so what I get by the homomorphism relation, I can put this inside, inside the sum, so I get this as y, uh, y, x, and v, that's the homomorphism. And uh, now this is a bijection, so this is uh, this mapping x maps to uh, y, x is a bijection over the group from g to g. So I can actually re uh, remove the y from in the sum. So I'm basically changing the order of summation. I'm summing over the whole space in, in the same way. Uh, so you get the same, same number at the end once you, once you apply this. And now this is inside w by definition. So this implies in particular that this w is a rho xi invariant. Which implies in particular, the die because rho size is irreducible, that rho is equal to, uh, or this w is equal to this, or w is equal to everything. Okay, so there's now like basically two cases that we need to consider in the in the proof. So, uh, to, so the first case, so the case one, is that when w is equal to this zero. And when the other case is when w is equal to the whole space uh, v, 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 v that we have here. So, uh, sorry, there should be a psi here. Um, so when it's equal to the, to the zero, then that implies by definition, if you look at the definition of w, what we have here, so it's all the points, um, uh, all these vectors or the linear combinations such that they map in, into here. So if this is, uh, is zero, that means that uh, this x in g rho xi of x of v is now equal to zero for any v in, um, what, what did I, v xi, 
uh, which implies that this uh, x in g rho psi is a zero matrix, which implies then that the Fourier transform of, of this uh, is equal to zero, but what I wanted to claim. And then the case two, so this is what we would be done if we can prove this. So I want to prove that the, if w is equal to everything, we will see a contradiction. Uh, and this would be actually with the, uh, with the fact that, we, remember that in the beginning we chose the Croke psi x0 being not equal to the, to the identity matrix. Uh, that was the kind of idea that if you have a non-trivial representation, if you're everything, then you have a contradiction with this. So how do we prove the contradiction? Uh, there, so the reason is here. Um, so if you assume by, by, by contradiction that this actually, uh, uh, if w is equal to v, we will get some kind of a contradiction with the statement. This means in particular, because if it's, if everything is mapped into everything, it means especially this linear map, if you map over G of the uh, row Xi X as a mapping from V, oh, so there's a big Xi here. Uh, this as a map from V cog V show is invertible. Because by the definition, remember the definition of W was all the images of these points, the linear mapping. Now, if it maps onto the V Xi, it's actually an invertible matrix or the linear mapping that we have here. But there, that, that's an imp uh, but on the other hand, if we, if we actually compute this, so we just take this uh, rho Xi at X, and now let's use the morphism relation again. So we can put inside here rho Xi X zero and then we can put a rho xi at x0 inverse of x, so I'm using the morphism, this is a equal to rho xi of x, but as uh, this uh, rho xi is a, is a, is a, <coughs> is a representation. It's a homomorphism, so you can actually use this, uh, use this property. So now if you take this all outside, you can actually prove that this is, okay, you get x0 outside, and then you get the sum g rho xi at the point x, uh, uh, x0 minus 1 x, but you actually get outside here the rho xi x0 and then you get uh, x g rho xi at x. And this is because the mapping x to x0 minus 1 x is a bijection g to g. So that's kind of the same as we had in the previous uh, above here that we have the bijectivity, so we have this uh, this same property. So now you now you have here you have an operator here you have an operator here and then you have uh, some uh, uh, another uh, operator here that you have mapping here. But we know that this operator that we have here and here this is invertible. Okay, so we can take an inverse from both sides. So taking inverse. we get that the identity matrix of f xi is equal to rho xi zero i xi because i'm taking the inverse of this so i'm taking this and it's inverse from the right and here it maps out here so it's just left with the rho xi zero and this is a uh, uh, this implies basically because this is yeah, this is now equal to rho xi of x zero that the rho xi x zero is equal to i zero, this is a contradiction. So it just came out of the being um, invertible um, for this mapping, and that's because we have non-trivial. Okay, so basically that's the basic idea that we have here, and uh, the final thing I wanted to mention before I go to the next week, so this is the last week's topic, that have a look at the lecture notes and you can see that if you do this all inside the group ZP, so if you do this in G is equal to ZP, you will see that the representations can be identified with here, so you can basically then see that somehow the, the dual group would be then uh, kind of identified with the uh, uh, you could identify this bit basically with uh, with uh, with ZP, um, uh, in the sense that if you if you use the representations rho k, 
this would be the, uh, uh, the representations you would use in the group. T is equal to e to the power minus 2 pi i uh, kt over p. Like you could use that t's for example if you wanted to t and that p uh, to define the representations uh, inside the group. <coughs> so you can see that they're basically just a one complex number on the on the on the on the circle, and that's the way you, you can represent them uh, in this way. So the, each of the indices here uh, k are defined to be k in z b. So that would be the index set that you would have in, inside here. So I put an example of kind of like how do you compute and you can prove that it's a homomorphism and it satisfies the kind of axioms of representation theory and unitary representations. And um, so it kind of extends naturally this theory in the ZP into this setting. And it's kind of like what we are doing here is this, all these like nice things about the matrices and everything. It gets a bit more complicated just because we are in, uh, we don't have this abelian structure inside the group uh, G anymore. Okay, so that's all for today, and uh, I hope you come for the last week next uh, uh, in, the, in the next lecture where we go into the um, basically uh, into the general kind of theory of the we talk about the convolution theorem and the Blanchard's theorem and these things that we we already did in the group set P setting and how these actually give us something. So that's all for today. Thanks.